right. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Um, you can just type in the comment or put a little thumbs up if you can. Okay, great. So we are going to get started today. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elisa Cherry, and I am a Middle East analyst at the Brussels International Center. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for being here today for our webinar entitled Yemen's Humanitarian Aid. Can everyone turn off their mics, please? Great, thank you so much. If you, if you could just make sure your mics are turned off, that would be great. So yes, welcome to our event entitled Yemen's Humanitarian Aid Response Plan, Biometric Technology and Civilian Security. So this event is a follow-up to a paper that was published by the Brussels International Center in August of 2020, uh, focusing on the use of biometric technology in international aid systems, specifically in Yemen. Um, the analysis demonstrated a need to establish a more sustainable aid delivery system in the country through prioritizing civilian needs and their livelihoods. So as we know, Yemen is experiencing the world's first humanitarian aid crisis which can be attributed to the ongoing conflict and at an international level, the complications that exist surrounding the humanitarian aid delivery um, in the country. Um, so over 80% of the population, close to 25 million people are reliant on humanitarian aid for their basic survival. And the humanitarian crisis in Yemen has only been exacerbated by allegations of stolen aid, decreases in funding and the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. So to help shed light on this topic today, I have the pleasure to welcome four distinguished speakers who will represent multiple different perspectives um, and expertise to the humanitarian situation in Yemen. First of all, we have Ms. Mona Lukman, the co-founder of Food for Humanity and one of Yemen's first uh, women-led civil society organizations, which works to combat famine and poverty in the country. She's also the chairwoman for the Women's Solidarity Network in Yemen, the largest network um, working on the Women, Peace and Security Framework. She is also the 2019 recipient of the International Young Women's and Human Rights Award for Democracy Today for her work on women's role in peace building and gender responsive policy. Second, I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Borja Migueles, the humanitarian desk officer in Yemen at the European Commission for Humanitarian Aid and Civil Protection, as well as Mr. Aidan O'Leary, Head of Office for the UN uh, Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Yemen, who has an extensive history of working on humanitarian affairs within the United Nations. Prior to his current posting in Yemen, um, he was Head of Office for OSHA in Iraq and the Head of Regional Office for, Sir for the Syrian Crisis and has also held positions as the head of office for OSHA in Afghanistan and the chief of polio eradication for UNICEF in Pakistan. Finally, our fourth speaker is Mr. Jean-Nicolas Bouz, the representative for United Nations High, High Commissioner for Refugees in Yemen. And prior to this post, he worked as the deputy representative for protection and interagency coordination in Lebanon. Um, he's also held posts with UNICEF as the child protection advisor for the MENA region, where he focused on emergency responses in Iraq, Libya, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, working to strengthen, strengthen public child protection and education in the region. So today we will be building a discussion on how to promote cooperation between the international aid institutions and the local communities. Each speaker will have roughly seven minutes to share their remarks. Followed by, um, or sorry, following the speaker's interjections, I will give them a chance to quickly respond to one another before we move into the question and answer session. So before we begin with the speakers, I just wanna go over a couple quick housekeeping rules. If you have any questions, um, please just type them in the chat box at any point, but know that they will not be addressed until the question and answer session at the end. Um, for our audience that's connecting via the Facebook live stream, please comment your questions um, as well in the comment section on Facebook. 
and our team will share the questions with me directly. Um, when asking questions, if it is directed towards a specific speaker, please note it as such. Um, as well, please kindly state your name and affiliation with your question. And um, small note again, just make sure that your microphone is turned off at all times. And if you have trouble connecting, um, try turning off your camera if your camera is on. So with that, I would like to hand the floor over to Mr. Jean-Nicolas Labouz um, for you to start your remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, merci, Elisa. And it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to join everyone this afternoon. Uh, it's even more uh, a pleasure for me to have uh, briefly seen uh, Muna on the, on the screen because I had heard of her great work as a local organization uh, back when I was in Canada where, where we, we have common friends who introduced me to, to her work and, uh, and what she's doing uh, on, the, on the food response in Yemen, but also in terms of uh, women's empowerment and, and human rights. Um, I'm not going to turn my camera because, unfortunately, uh, the connection in Sana is not uh, that great. But let me make just a, a few introductory remarks, as you asked me, Elisa, uh, speaking about the, the 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 hot topic, I would say, of uh, um, local um, local ownership of uh, humanitarian responses. This is really something which has been on the agenda of the international community for quite a while. But I think we will all remember that in 2016, during the World Humanitarian uh, Conference or Summit uh, and the uh, infamous uh, uh, Grand Bargain, there was a commitment on the part of donors, but also of UN agencies like UNHCR uh, to make sure that uh, 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 a big part of our intervention and our funding will go to local organizations. There was really this sense that um, not enough had been done to capacitate local responders to be uh, the one uh, doing the needs assessment, uh, doing the response, doing the post distribution monitoring, and so on and so forth. And uh, if I want to give the example of UNHCR, I think globally we are really trying to abide by this commitment with probably two thirds and perhaps in some situation, three quarters of our partners being national or local uh, non-governmental organization. In the case of Yemen, uh, it was a conscientious choice of UNHR to go even further and have the overwhelming majority of our partners being local and national organizations. I would say that probably 95, if not more, of our partners in Yemen uh, on both sides of the uh, conflict line are actual uh, national and uh, community-based organizations. <coughs> This comes with a lot of uh, advantages, and I will flag a few, but also with a few additional responsibilities on our part and a few challenges, I will say. Of course, in terms of advantages, it means that um, the local partners know the situation on the ground much better than anyone else. They may be very aware and mindful of sociocultural sensitivities on how to approach uh, potential beneficiaries of uh, the humanitarian aid. They have the network uh, amongst local and um, traditional leader, which is extremely important in the context of Yemen, where the tribal structure is uh, certainly very well rooted in the society. Um, but also on something like uh, what we uh, lived through uh, during COVID. Uh, with the uh, uh, COVID uh, travel restriction, it was quite difficult for a number of partners to cross from one governorate to another because of quarantine center, uh, limitation on movement, and so on. UNHCR didn't have this problem because basically all our partners, or most of our partners, 95% of our partners, are already on the ground close to the beneficiaries, close to the people that we, we sell. And therefore, it proved very useful in an environment like COVID, but you can make the same argument for security. Uh, it proved quite useful to be able to rely on this network of uh, national partners. 
having said that, what, what I've just said is, is uh, stated is really the obvious and everybody knows those advantages. I'm also going to state a little bit the obvious, but perhaps make it uh, specific to the context in Yemen in terms of the challenges. Or what I would say is the increased responsibility of the international partners, UN and international NGOs, uh, in terms of providing capacity building, but also oversight on those uh, national partners. We do really recognize that they have a lot of knowledge and skills, but I think uh, both the national partners and ourselves will recognize that there's still room for uh, capacity building of their staff in how we abide by humanitarian principle, how do we conduct uh, independent needs assessment, how do we assess the impact through post-distribution monitoring of the intervention that we have done on the ground and so on and so forth. In a context like uh, Yemen, it will come to no surprise because, Elisa, you mentioned it in your introduction, uh, that there's also um, issues related to oversight. How do we make sure that our national partners are not, because we are uh, in an active conflict, are not subjected to bias, interference, undue pressure by different armed elements? It may be the parties to the conflict, or it may be very localized armed groups uh, or even traditional uh, uh, leaders who may want to influence uh, the way they go about their business of assessing uh, needs and delivering assistance to the most needy. Um, there's no doubt that in a, in a context like uh, Yemen, where the tribal structure play a, a key role, uh, including in terms of providing support and relief to the population, because we have to acknowledge uh, that uh, the tribal structure is also very uh, supportive of its own population, but perhaps in a discriminatory way. If you look at Yemen, for example, the Muamashin, which is uh, uh, a group uh, of, of, of people, I mean, there's different uh, interpretation about their origin, but eventually probably coming from uh, from uh, East Africa have been particularly discriminated and are not part of this tribal structure and therefore al always uh, are left always aside. But uh, in a tribal structure, how do we ensure that the uh, um, uh, local partners apply this non-discriminatory principle uh, or this need-based uh, approach to uh, um, the, the relief that they bring to the population? How do we avoid that there is what we will call clientelism uh, or nepotism and that uh, uh, a, a partner in a, a certain environment will take care mostly of the dominant tribe or the dem dominant group in that part of the te territory? Um, I, th I think this is a constant uh, challenge. It may be um, particularly um, flagrant in the case of Yemen because of this multi-layers uh, element, conflict, tribal structure, security, but also, and we have to recognize it, because the authorities, both in the north and in the south, uh, really want to um, impress upon the, the humanitarian partner certain ideas or certain ways of doing a business. And here I'm speaking about the coordinating body in the north, which is referred as Scamsha, and in the south, referred as the executive unit. We have to recognize that it's legitimate that uh, authorities on the ground want to influence the humanitarian response. It's their people, it's their territory, and they feel also most probably an obligation towards their own population. But in the context of Yemen, as opposed to other countries which have had a more developed, de developed civil uh, servant uh, capacity, including because of having been exposed for years to humanitarian response, there's still a lot of uh, uh, work to be done, I would say, to create awareness with these authorities for them to understand what are really, so to speak, the rule of the game when you do uh, humanitarian um, assistance. The last one that I will uh, uh, make, because you asked me, Elisa, to look at the issue of a uh, long term and the transitioning to uh, livelihood, self-reliance, and how can we strengthen the resilience 
of the population. This is very much on, on the mind of everybody. How do you avoid a de dependency when you know that um, uh, in 2018, I think Yemen received $5 billion. In 2019, it was four point something billion dollars out of a total of $28 billion. And it's true that the situation is dire in Yemen, but if you think that $5 billion out of $30 billion globally has been dedicated only for Yemen, what does that mean for the Central African Republic? What does that mean for uh, Venezuela? What does that mean for Bangladesh and Myanmar? And, and the list is very long. And I think uh, the question that you are asking, Elisa, today is really important. How do we start thinking of, of our exit strategy? A lot of work is done here in Yemen on uh, cash assistance and UNHR has the largest cash program for this place. How do you already start to see what is referred in the cash world as a graduation? How do we help people graduate out of uh, the cash assistance by empowering them to be self-reliant and not dependent anymore of the cash assistance, the shelter kids, the food, uh, and so on and so forth? I think it's difficult because um, we are still very much in an emergency mode with constant di displacement. We are the fourth largest displacement due to conflict globally. Uh, we have a flash flooding um, back in March and again in July and, and, and August. And it's very difficult in this respect to see what are the exit strategy for us uh, to move towards what uh, ECO in particular will call early recovery or transition and what is the buzzword of the day, the nexus, the nexus between humanitarian and, and development. I think it's really a question that we need to put more on the table. I'm not sure that we have the, the, the freedom of, I mean, the, the, the free mind, the, the, the free space sorry, in our mind to really uh, look into it, but it's definitely a question. And this will come through and to close the loop will come through supporting local NGO, local partners, but also local public institution in being the one delivering against uh, the, uh, the rights of the, of the Yemeni people. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, jean Nicolas. That was very, very interesting and incredibly insightful um, to your work and also the work that needs to be done. Um, and I think there's lots of opportunity for um, growth and and uh, change to happen within the humanitarian aid sector in Yemen. But um, we can't we can't lose hope. Um, so with that, I would like to pass the floor over to Mona Lukman, who is going to provide a um, local perspective. So Mona, please, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you for this excellent presentation by John. I think that he touched the point uh, on very important points, uh, and I'm so happy to hear um, about the national partners and uh, actors uh, and his point of view uh, coming from a UN agency, uh, because we have been speaking about this for a very long time. It's really the first time that I actually hear the positive points, and I also agree with him. Um, uh, on the ground and the domination of uh, uh, of aid, and I think that will be uh, more linked to uh, a continuous um, uh, restructuring of the partnerships and 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 also of course the capacity uh, building. Um, so I'm I'm going to go a little uh, backwards a little bit. Um, first of all, we have a, a dire situation, of course, in Yemen that we all know very well. Um, and the food insecurity and the tragic um, um, uh, natural disasters that are also happening um, are just making the, uh, the situation more acute. And also at the same time, um, we have the COVID-19 spread, which is still spreading within the community. Um, but um, I'm afraid that it's fading away from the media. Uh, and that is also um, um, a, a big challenge that we all have to, as humanitarians, um, re, um, reposition ourselves to, to respond and to create awareness in a better way. So um, uh, going back to, um, to the flash fl uh, uh, floods, for instance, it was the Yemeni women who were there 
first um, to uh, relieve the, uh, the the people who are trapped in the in the flooded areas in Kanawas and Tehama, um, and it was also the women who were uh, opening the corridors and negotiating safe zones in Taiz, where none of the international community is there. Um, this is not a competition between national actors or international uh, organizations or UN agencies. Um, this this is really re what we're really advocating for is collaboration, efficiency, and this is the key word that we really want to think about today: uh, efficiency and impact. Um, and I think that um, uh, one of the one of the sayings, uh, "One clap doesn't, uh, one uh, hand doesn't clap." Uh, really is very relevant here because this is what we're really thinking about. National actors cannot on their own uh, do all the work, but they um, are an, an important stakeholder. They should not be overlooked and uh, they could be a big part of the, um, uh, of the, uh, uh, sorry, let me just try to open because it's, uh, so I was just saying that um, I think that uh, it's so Im important that the, uh, the local actors, um, uh, participate not only in the implementation or distribution uh, of aid or cash transfers, but they have to be in there within the uh, uh, the designing process and um, uh, and all the all, all the all the uh, different uh, various uh, sectors of the humanitarian uh, uh, aid procedure and specifically women-led organizations. And I'm saying this from a uh, more than 20 years of experience in this field. And I know exactly how the women strategize, how they fundraise, how they organize themselves, how they mobilize. Um, and, and that's also uh, including the, the youth, but they're the, really the women who are even mobilizing uh, the youth, and it's so important. Um, I think that the failure to work together um, will lead to more gaps in coverage, um, and to also dip, uh, duplications in, uh, efficient, uh, and inefficiencies uh, in the emergency response. Um, I think that uh, we also have um, um, a really important um, opportunity to have more impact, to have more outreach, specifically now after COVID-19 and so many um, also uh, the visa restrictions and all the um, challenges that international organizations are facing. I think during all of this, all of these challenges, I think this is uh, really the time to rethink uh, the humanitarian aid process, uh, the operations in Yemen, and to really restructure it um, uh, in, in, a, in a more flexible way that, um, that removes the barriers. Uh, this, there are so many barriers um, to gain... Um, uh, more um, to access, for instance, the humanitarian polling funds. Uh, it's so difficult for women-led organizations uh, to access them. Our members are telling us that we have to, um, some of the conditions, are, the preconditions are like you have to have a, at least an annual budget of $200,000 and things like that. And I think um, this is really the time to rethink the uh, some of those conditions and start thinking of a more flexible uh, way to support women-led organizations on the ground. Um, I remember Lisa Grande was uh, once saying that 80% uh, of the real work that's happening in the communities is led by women, and that's a really uh, important statement by her. Um, and we all know how um, how they are able to access, but with limited funds, with limited resources, uh, the impact is is low. So I think that um, um, it's not enough to just have some organizations as partners in the clusters, uh, others are excluded, specifically those who are not in uh, Sana'a City. Uh, this is really um, uh, inefficient. And we keep, hearing, um, we keep hearing the billions and billions and billions of dollars that are uh, coming into aid into Yemen, and it's really, frankly, very frustrating for us. Um, uh, as uh, the locals um, seeing so many people who are in so much need uh, and in dire situations, and then you hear all these billions and the question comes up with, where is the money? And I think that's how it came up, the, um, uh, the, the youth activist campaign, where is the money, which was really uh, focusing on uh, more transparency and um, um, I think they sent so many uh, emails to many of the organizations requesting more uh, 
um, uh, transparency on, on, on the work. But to be frank and to be also um, practical, uh, nothing in Yemen would be, uh, no aid in Yemen at all would be enough. Um, I mean, uh, there is so much uh, drastic situation and devastation and economic uh, um, uh, com completely, I mean, failure of the economy and uh, the uh, destruction of the infrastructure, everything. Uh, and so um, the only thing that could really help Yemen is um, to end this war and to, uh, uh, to have a sustainable uh, peace solution, which is inclusive and comprehensive. But in the meantime, one of the most important uh, elements of, uh, which is actually fueling uh, is the economic situation and people haven't had their salaries in the past three to four years. I mean, we have at least 160,000 um, uh, teachers who haven't had their, their salaries and are literally begging in the streets uh, because of the stray. We've seen professors who um, are now selling bread. That's if they can get a, um, a, a job or something. So um, this is all fueling the conflict. It's also drivers of the um, of the famine in Yemen. We keep speaking about the famine in Yemen, but we never really touch on uh, the drivers of the conflict. So just to in, uh, to summary, uh, summarize, um, I also want to just um, point out that there is also a lack of donor policy, uh, coherence between the humanitarian, the conflict and development uh, work, uh, which is also having more different uh, funding streams. This is also, um, uh, having impact and it's also excluding women from the process um, and I think that um, the uh, the main um, point that I would really like to come out of this and especially to see in the in the coming months um, in Yemen is more aid uh, directed towards uh, livelihood projects um, uh, and also complete humanitarian uh, um, operations in Yemen uh, things have changed. The conflict is uh, having more and more impact. Uh, we have at least 750,000 families who are displaced now because of the escalation of the Houthi rebels in, in, in Marib and the fighting between the government uh, forces there. Uh, we have um, uh, host communities that are overwhelmed. And I think that there is a lot of um, emphasis and uh, focus by the uh, UN agencies on, um, on displacement camps. But they're not a lot. It's the, the main issue is in the host communities, in communities where in the in the mountains where people have fled from the fighting, for instance, in the siege city of Taz. These people are literally starving to death. Uh, recently, last month, we found a, a whole village in Dubai, in Taz. Uh, at least 350 families were literally starving to death. And um, um, they were in need of a water project because most of them are facing um, um, uh, viruses and uh, and so many other uh, different uh, diseases and viruses there because they don't have clean water because they had fled to this area. And this is um, these are the types of projects that we really need now in Yemen uh, to support uh, uh, these, um, uh, these families who are fleeing from the, um, uh, from the fighting. Um, I think the, um, um, I want to just, um, point out a little bit on the uh, international uh, role of the, uh, the community, the international community. Um, I think that um, sh um, we are focusing a lot on short-term uh, food aid and humanitarian aid. Um, I think we need to uh, focus more on the, um, uh, on the uh, uh, reviving the livelihoods of the people. Um, I think we are really focusing um, on thinking that maybe this this conflict will will end soon but it's been six years and uh, some study uh, studies suggest that displacement um, could lead could lead to at least 17 years not just in yemen but in general uh, the cycle of displacement is at least 17 years so these people need livelihood um they need assistance, uh, assistance and they also need um provision of skills training economic uh, opportunity that lead to real self-reliance uh, um, so that these displaced, uh, displaced communities can regain and uh, redevelop their uh, livelihoods, especially that these, these
these people actually also have many skills uh, that we can also as a community benefit from. Um, I also want to um, emphasize on the importance of the international community, and I know that the EU and others are working on this, uh, but we need to see more, and I have seen an increase, uh, and I'm so happy that we've been seeing more and more projects um, uh, on livelihood sectors, but we need to also think um, about the fisheries, uh, agriculture, um, especially the uh, fisherwomen. We have at least 150 in, uh, in the south, in Aden, um, they need support. Um, we also need to um, provide more flexible funding for the youth. And I want to emphasize the youth, the youth, the youth. Um, we need to protect um, these uh, young uh, men and women from violence. Um, and we need to um, um, protect them from, more, from uh, the abuse also. Um, these, um, I think uh, these are the points I wanted to touch on, and then we can uh, further um, discuss if there are any questions. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mona. And um, yeah, I mean, the local perspective is really, it's it's the forefront of this discussion. And um, I think with what Jean-Nicolas said and what you said, I think there needs to be um, greater coherence and um, participation between groups um, from the local and international perspective in creating a discussion and a plan um, on how to improve the livelihoods um, in, in Yemen and, and really focusing on a long-term strategy. Um, so I'm hoping that we can um, talk about that a little bit more in the discussion, uh, the question and answer part of the discussion. So with that, I wanna turn the floor to Mr. Borja Migueles um, from DG ECHO at the European Commission, who is going to talk about um, the role of the European Union in the humanitarian aid crisis. So with that, Borja, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elisa, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to join you today in the discussion. Uh, we very much look forward to the debate also, especially, and the exchange of, of perspectives. Um, I, as you said, I, I work for the DG ECHO, the Director General uh, of the European Union for Humanitarian Aid, and I bring a little bit a uh, more distant perspective than the accounts that uh, Jean-Nicolas and Muna brought uh, uh, to the discussion, which is more the HQ perspective. Uh, where some of the program, big programmatic and, and advocacy decisions are, 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 are made. Uh, and in the context of Yemen, I think we all agree on the many different levels of needs and what would be required, uh, starting from peace uh, and following for, with development, livelihoods, uh, uh, encouragement of participation of women, youth, etc. cetera. Uh, but I would like to maybe recall a little bit some of the contextual limitations that we are under also to, to, to be able to explain why our priorities are, are the priorities I will, I will briefly present to you. Um, I have been in this desk since May 2017 and uh, it is, I think, the sense we all have about this, this, this huge concern about the relentless deterioration of the situation and uh, sometimes there are some drivers of um, become part of the landscape a little bit, and, and we just take them for granted, and, and we try to adapt in that uh, in that uh, increasingly limiting environment. But we shouldn't we shouldn't forget those limiting factors because, in fact, they are preventing us from addressing more effectively uh, and more efficiently what we would need to do. And as Muna said, uh, efficiency and impact should be very strong. Uh, ideas in our minds when we when we when we roll out any any kind of support, particularly in Yemen, but in other humanitarian contexts. Um, this crisis is man-made, and there are several drivers that are not humanitarian, but are uh, definitely uh, bringing the situation to a very very gruesome level. And uh, if we are to stop uh, cases of famine risk of famine, like the ones that Muna was alluding to in that village near Thais, but uh, also the risk that has been reported by UN across the country in several months if the situation is not redressed. Uh, with humanitarian aid, we will not be able to accomplish that uh, that kind of task. We we need to, to do some parallel activities. And 
this was a little bit the discussion that we had on the Unga side event on, to, on the 23rd of, of September, where most of the participants uh, made it very clear, uh, we, we must address the drivers of the crisis. We need to stabilize the currency. We need to ensure some level of payment of uh, salaries for public servants that are delivering the, the, the public services. Mm, we need to ensure sufficient imports into the country of fuel, food, basic commodities, and we need to grant unrestricted humanitarian access to populations in need. And this is not new. This has been repeated in many briefings to the Security Council by, by DRC, uh, Mark Lowcock, by many actors. This is, this is commonly known, but um, unless we keep focusing on bringing some stability in these drivers, we will not main, mitigate the impact, uh, the humanitarian, the huge humanitarian impact that this, this crisis is having. Um, of course, funding is an element, uh, and the fact that uh, access has been so difficult and there have been so many attempts to interfere, some donors are, are, are back paddling, in their support, which is very worrying for us because we, we still feel that uh, despite all these difficulties, there is a space to do more and to do better. Uh, so we should maintain both levels of engagement, a constructive uh, engagement to bring solutions, to find solutions collectively. Uh, but unless we do this uh, multi-level approach with drivers, with funding and improving the operating environment. And I would like to highlight this because I think for the humanitarian community and for our program particularly, but for all the humanitarian actors, uh, this is a, a really a real concern for us. The, the, the decreasing space, the, the restrictive environment, the, the impossibility to operate with a minimum uh, accountability and according to the very basic uh, principles of humanitarian aid, Partiality, neutrality, and independence. Uh, uh, as uh, Jean Nicola uh, mentioned, the rules of the game when you are doing humanitarian aid. Uh, um, with this context, uh, in ECHO, we have um, adopted a, a, a strategy that is basically focused on two areas. One, of course, we are a donor, so we, we, we have a package of support, financial support uh, for Yemen. And, um, this year, we have reached the same level of support as last year. So we haven't decreased. We have maintained uh, 150 million euros uh, this year as we did last year. These operations are uh, focused on two key areas. One is direct uh, impact of conflict, people in displacement or people uh, besieged uh, uh, locations. And then we are also supporting the most vulnerable groups that are affected by the food security, nutrition and health crisis. Triggered by the lack of payment of salaries and, and the overall uh, economic crisis. Of course, uh, some may argue this is not enough. This is too much of a focus on humanitarian aid as uh, uh, the needs are enormous. But I think also uh, we need to, to, to strike a good balance between the priorities and what we can achieve. And we feel that even with these priorities, our funding allocation is, is, uh, is not sufficient and we need the involvement of all potential donors in this crisis. Uh, we work uh, largely through direct contracts with UN and international organizations, but for all of them, uh, I dare to say without exclusion, the partnership with local actors is essential, local uh, organizations. And I think we are very much in line with what Muna said uh, about the collaboration. It's not an issue of competition. It's not a binary uh, logic. It is, uh, it is about collaboration. It's about uh, bringing in the added value of each actor, making the, making the humanitarian response principled, effective, uh, contextually sensitive, also as uh, jean Nicola uh, highlighted as a concern, to be adapted to the context. And this, of course, uh, working with uh, local organizations is always uh, better. Uh, otherwise, it would be impossible to have this kind of, of, of uh, adaptability. 
So in that sense, uh, very much uh, in favor also from our side, and we assess the proposals and the, the, the projects where we invest our funding, we uh, select them in terms of quality of the proposals, and this is part of that quality design, as much as the participation of uh, vulnerable groups, etc. being the civilians always uh, at the center of our response. And because we are aware and concerned with this limiting environment, part of it, we feel that just funding is not enough. So we have done uh, a lot of work actually on the advocacy part, which is the second part of the main second block of our work, besides the program. It's the advocacy uh, to coordinate with other donors, with other services of the European Union, and to engage with the relevant authorities and the stakeholders to improve the humanitarian uh, working environment. And uh, well, just to mention some initiatives this year, as many of you may know, in February we had the first humanitarian senior official meeting that we hosted with Sweden here in Brussels, 13th of February. Uh, then we just organized another side event uh, in September, and we are intending to um, to have an, a follow up of the senior official meeting later in November, where we would like to precisely discuss some of the things that were highlighted in September, which are how can we collectively address more effectively uh, the drivers of the crisis, notwithstanding that the parties have a huge responsibility to do as much as they can to alleviate these restrictions according to their obligations of international humanitarian law. Then how we can uh, mobilize uh, additional funding. I think since September we saw a, a, a slight increase in, in the materialization of earlier pledges. And uh, then of course take a stock where, where we are since the meeting in February on the humanitarian environment, the conditions for, for our partners to work in, and how shall we uh, move forward uh, in the current uh, situation, in the current circumstances. And I think with this, I, I would like to stop here and I would be very, very glad to, to hear uh, later on how the debate goes and how uh, our the participants, uh, uh, what are areas that uh, they would like to clarify? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Borja. And um, yeah, I think we're just continuing to create a more well rounded approach to this discussion in terms of having um, multiple different perspectives um, from the EU side, from the international institution side, and of course, the local perspective, um, which I think is important. So, um, just a quick reminder to everyone, if you can type your questions in the chat, if you have any um, French, Arabic, English, all are okay and we will translate it. Um, we will answer all the questions in English, but um, you can type your questions in your preferred language and we will make sure that our team gets it translated before we uh, move on to the question and answer. So our final speaker is Mr. Aidan O'Leary. Um, from the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. So I'm going to give him the floor now, and I think he will be able to round out our discussion um, in terms of providing another international um, perspective to humanitarian aid in Yemen. So, Mr. O'Leary, the floor is yours. Thanks, Peace and uh, to colleagues. Uh, I very much appreciate the kind of opportunity to participate. Um, but recognize that I might have some challenges trying to follow on uh, Boya, Muna, and uh, Jeanne, but I will try my best. Uh, in terms of the kind of presentation on my side, it was perhaps focus on uh, maybe two different levels. One is, you know, our, the general context and the kind of the challenges we face and are increasingly likely to face uh, at the macro level in the course of the next uh, three, six, nine, twelve months. And then maybe to delve in a little bit further on the kind of the cash voucher landscape, which is are essentially the, or what we basically need to think of in terms of a, a way forward. So I think that the first thing that I would highlight is that uh, when we talk about the drivers of conflict, uh, we need to be very clear that uh, are the, the drivers of the humanitarian crisis. It's essentially the uh, the conflict and it's the economic blockade. So uh, Yemen as a 
or uh, in terms of conflict dynamics, since the start of the year, we've seen a, an increase of almost number of the conflict lines from uh, uh, 35 uh, to almost 44. So, uh, notwithstanding the call by the Secretary General for ceasefires, we're dealing with a conflict that is continuing to grow and escalate, not to uh, de-escalate and provide space for implementation. I think also the dynamics of the economic blockade. Uh, you know, clearly when we talk about access uh, for populations, uh, Yemen is uh, almost entirely dependent on imports uh, for the uh, sustenance of its population. Uh, and we have our, an absolutely massive dependence on the continued functioning of uh, the uh, seaports of Aden and Hudaydah in particular. And there's a whole range of different dynamics that kind of flow from that. There's also the, uh, or what I would call the ongoing functioning of the uh, central bank, the, the challenges with maintaining exchange rate uh, or stability, uh, the huge loss of remittances as a result of uh, the uh, COVID pandemic, all of which are continuing to compound the, the challenges we are there at the moment. So what are the kind of key needs uh, that we face in Yemen at this point in time? I think, uh, Lisa, as you pointed out at the, the start, uh, there are 24.3 million people in need, uh, more than 50% uh, of whom are in acute need. So uh, even before the COVID pandemic, uh, we face our kind of many, many challenges in terms of uh, life-saving activities that need to be undertaken uh, to keep Yemenis alive. And that can basically span the uh, question of disease outbreak uh, and the critical importance of the functionality of health and wash systems. It's the broader food insecurity situation where there are more than uh, 20 people or 20 million people in need. And what we've seen during the course of this year is a steady reduction in the capacity of the humanitarian system to respond to that. And that is, you know, even before the start of the, the conflict or the, uh, the latest challenges on the operating environment, uh, we were kind of supporting 13 million of the 20 million that are identified. And it's that 13 million that's reducing, not just the 20 million. And I think is also Nick has touched upon, uh, we're dealing with also one of the largest displacement crises. Uh, and again, what I'd like to do is, I mean, we're talking about nearly 3.5, 3.6 million uh, IDPs. So the numbers are not small. Uh, these are not issues that are kind of static and stable. Uh, even as we speak, we continue to see quite large scale displacement taking place in the vicinity of uh, Marab. Uh, as we are have this conversation uh, taking place today. So it's not something that's staying still, it's actually continuing to get worse. And as I say, the both the public health and the socioeconomic parts of our, the impact of COVID uh, are exactly the on the ground. Uh, I think uh, Borja, I think quite correctly spoke to just the operating environment and Yemen is probably uh, the most scrutinized operating environment anywhere in the world. So there are millions and millions of people who are hard to reach in terms of what I would call uh, principled, effective and efficient humanitarian delivery. Uh, repeat that, principled, effective and efficient humanitarian delivery. It's not just drop and go. We need to make sure that the assistance uh, is correctly targeted and delivered and overseen to those who are actually in the most acute need. And uh, again, when we talk about hard to reach, uh, what are the factors that drive that? In the main, it's bureaucratic obstacles at all levels. It's the conflict dynamic, and it's also uh, what I would call a whole range of logistical challenges, recognizing the very specific supply routes uh, that exist and the multiplicity of uh, conflict lines, which are, as I mentioned earlier, increasing, not decreasing. Now, we do have a or kind of a, a strategy in place to try and uh, manage that. I think Borja also spoke to uh, the kind of our Brussels uh, song process, uh, where we have a kind of a strategy of maximum advocacy, uh, benchmarks for the operating our environment in terms of delivery, and also a, a process of risk calibration to make sure that you know, we are actually able to deliver in an effective, efficient, and in a principled way. There has been progress, but there's more to do. So, and I think what we have to recognize is that as humanitarians, we need to continue to uh, squeeze that envelope to make sure that we continue to deliver to the maximum number of people with a particular focus on those in acute need. I think that the final point that uh, I'd like to talk about maybe on the general context is 
the funding. And I think Jean Nick very correctly spoke to very high levels of funding that uh, Yemen has historically enjoyed. So when we faced uh, the risk of famine in late 2018, the uh, basically the world mobilized uh, massive levels of resources uh, in support of the humanitarian response. It also uh, there was resources mobilized to fully capitalize the central bank to uh, maintain exchange rate stability, to uh, provide the necessary liquidity to make sure public sector salaries were uh, paid, and to make sure that there was sufficient liquidity in the system to make sure that people could actually uh, afford the minimum food baskets that were required to stay alive. So again, I think what's going to be kind of really important is to kind of recognize that's what we have done in the past. Where we stand today is that uh, of the kind of resources required for 2020, the 3.2 billion, which is the desired, and even, shall we say, based on the, the lower uh, figure of kind of, are based on, uh, you know, without any constraints, uh, we're still at a figure of roughly 1.1, $1.2 billion. That's a really large drop. And what it means is that we're now doing far, far less than uh, what we were doing in the, the past. And I think we, we need to kind of be aware that this hard prioritization uh, that's necessary re are required in an effective and efficient way, those pressures are going to grow. And I think because of uh, the, the, the global challenges of COVID, uh, particularly amongst traditional donors, uh, Gulf donors and beyond, uh, this is not going to be a, a one-off aberration. This is, uh, I suspect, a reality that we're going to be dealing with uh, for the coming number of months and years. And I think, uh, you know, the, the kind of question that we're talking about in terms of response modalities and how we go, uh, the whole question of how we become more effective and efficient becomes even more pertinent. Now, specifically on the response to our modalities, I think uh, when we look at the proportion of cash uh, as the uh, in the humanitarian response, uh, I think it's somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 percent. And our, that's basically uh, drawn from a range of different partners. Uh, we have local NGOs, we have our INGOs, we have our UN agencies. Uh, but we also have to remember that there are also uh, very well-established long-term programs in Yemen, which date back to the 1990s. So we have the, the kind of social protection fund uh, and a, similar, a range of similar funds, which have uh, basically microfinance uh, networks established at the local level. So there is a strong cash infrastructure in Yemen. Uh, the challenge is how do we actually work to, to bring it all together in as coherent uh, a way as uh, we possibly can. Uh, I think as uh, Muna cor uh, quite correctly said, uh, there is no kind of uh, either or. It's uh, how do we actually work towards harmonization, complementarity, interoperability, to make sure that uh, we actually have our, what we would call effective targeting, uh, you know, appropriate levels of kind of transfer values and effective and efficient mechanisms. I think this is something that uh, we're going to have to continue to our, uh, strengthen the existing work underway uh, towards that end. So the, these kind of issues of harmonization, interoperability, uh, they are kind of what I would call the more common vision that brings together what I would call the kind of one year cycles of the humanitarian system with perhaps the longer term systems of the more established funds and institutions inside the country uh, remains a, a key area that needs to be addressed. And I think the point that I would probably make uh, in relation to this is that there's also hard choices in terms of uh, delivery because what we are actually looking at is not small scale needs. We're looking at massive scales of need, uh, overwhelming levels of need, not just millions, but tens of millions of people who are in need of assistance, not just for food assistance, uh, but for almost every form of intervention that exists. I think the, the whole approach that we're kind of looking at uh, you know, this challenge for principled delivery, effective delivery, efficient delivery, uh, this will be the challenges that we currently face. Uh, we're kind of faced with a choice of evolution or revolution. And the, our, the, the challenge sometimes with the systems that we face is that we often promise uh, revolution, 
and deliver evolution. And I think the challenge is we should perhaps talk about evolution and evolution instead. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Aiden. And um, yeah, your your last um, remark on evolution or revolution is um, very powerful. Um, I think one of the things that all of the speakers um, kind of talked about was the fact that this crisis is not going away um, and that there is really, unfortunately, no end in sight to, to this conflict and to this humanitarian aid crisis. And so now it's about trying to find ways to manage um, and to address the long-term plan for the humanitarian aid situation. So I'm going to start with um, a question for all of the speakers um, from myself, and then we will move into um, questions. We've got a couple questions from the Facebook, and then if you, if any of the participants in the in the WebEx have um, questions, just feel free to to type them in the chat. So um, let me start with a question for Mona because last week we had a really wonderful conversation on the phone. And I just wanted to see if you could very quickly in you know, maybe one or two minutes, give some examples of local initiatives that have been carried out recently to assist in the humanitarian efforts um, of Yemenis. And how does your organization, Food for Humanity specifically, as well as other local organizations, um, engage with international actors such as the UN and the EU to create more sustainable livelihoods for civilians? So um, Mona, I'll give that question to you first, and then I have another question for um, Borja, Jean-Nicolas, and Aiden. Okay, thanks, Elisa. Uh, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, I think that um, uh, tough, tough situations uh, always uh, give you um, another perspective if you're willing to have that um, flexible uh, mindset. And that's what we did when we heard about um, a, um, um, a water conflict uh, or a dispute actually that started in um, uh, in an area which is between Eb and Taz, two cities. Um, and uh, it ended up into uh, a, a beginning of, uh, or it ignited um, an armed conflict. Um, so we, we heard about it and we, we uh, tried to um, to send a team there. Uh, we managed to, um, to understand that there, there was a water uh, problem and uh, uh, we sent some engineers to uh, to fix it. We fundraised. It was a so it was all led by the women. Uh, the fundraising, uh, the uh, the implementation uh, was uh, strategized by the women and led by uh, uh, the youth in the area. Um, and so, uh, so the the water station now feeds for ten thousand families in nine villages. Uh, but we did, we we went beyond that. Um, we saw that the young girls also uh, were the main ones who were traveling uh, uh, for long hours to to get to fetch the water um, in very difficult circumstances and many times being harassed themselves. So what we did is we put them back into school. Uh, we um, also um, uh, fixed up the school that was in the area. Um, and now we also have um, a school for 300 uh, young girls. Uh, we also built some um, um, uh, bathrooms there because there are many uh, sanitation. And we are also um, uh, currently now um, transforming this area into a nice peaceful area where there is also agriculture and we're putting into place uh, greenhouses for the women to work. And all of this wouldn't have been, a we wouldn't have been able to do this if we hadn't given them that kind of incentive and a lot of awareness um, uh, around the project. So I'm so happy that this area in Al um is, um, uh, is is well. We then um, reapplied the same uh, the same model in other uh, areas, and now we have four new stations and hopefully four new schools. and uh, And this is all led by the women. And I really want to thank the the Yemeni diaspora, uh, men and women, um, or as we call them in Arabic, al muftaribin They are the ones who are really supporting so many uh, families in Yemen. And many times they ask me. How come the Yemeni uh, Yemenis are still, you know, uh, resilient and still supporting? And I really must say that one of the main points is because of the support of the Yemeni dis diaspora. Um, so th this is one of the uh, one of the main uh, projects. It's called the Water for Peace project, where we try to um, 
not only um, provide water, but we're also uh, trying to provide a community experience where they all work together and become more resilient and um, provide for their own families without having to rely on us. So I think that, that in summary, and I'm, uh, I will be happy to share with anybody if you want to know more. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, so, okay, my next question is for um, the, the institutional side of this discussion. So, um, aid funding um, to the humanitarian crisis in Yemen received massive um, cuts in 2020 at the UN level um, within multiple different sectors and agencies. Um, and I know it's a very complex process for, for the distribution of funds. Um, but what are some of the major challenges that UNHCR and OSHA face from these funding cuts? Um, and further, how can actors such as the European Union engage with fundraising and donations to ensure um, that these commitments are met in terms of humanitarian funding and uh, actually like getting the pledges um, that, that were promised? So I don't know, how about we start with um, Jean-Nicolas, if you have um, a perspective to add on this, on this question. Thanks, Elisa. And as you said, it's quite a complex um, issue to follow the, or to track the funding, which is uh, uh, provided in any given uh, uh, operation. Um, there are some systems put in place by uh, OCHA, the financial tracking system, which depends a lot on the goodwill and the cooper timely cooperation of both the donors, but also the recipient of aid to update. And my point, um, this is, I, I'm, I'm making this introduction because I think we have to be careful about uh, going a bit uh, beyond just the big numbers. Um, some sectors have been more affected than others by what you refer as a, a reduction of the funding. Um, in, the, in the case of, of UNHCR, for example, we are to, at a similar level of funding as last year. What I think is interesting in the case of Yemen, and something that um, Borja may, we, may wish to speak about, is the fact that we see more and more earmarking of the funding that we receive. Um, we have a few key uh, donors, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, the US, in the past, the other Gulf countries were key donors, of course, uh, the EU and a number of uh, European countries, um, the UK and Sweden, for example. Um, but what we see is that more and more earmarking in terms of, not from all of those donors, but in, ter uh, in terms of what we can do in the country. Even sometimes some donors try to say where we should be um, delivering our humanitarian assistance. And you know that in the context of Yemen, we're having two um, different authorities, or maybe three now, uh, over the country. Um, there is a risk if the humanitarian partners are not free to be guided by a needs-based approach, be guided by this impartiality and the, the in, independence of our needs assessment. Um, I think what is also interesting in, in the case of Yemen is really the importance of what we used to call a few years back non-traditional donors to the humanitarian community. The, uh, here I'm speaking about really the Gulf countries, but beyond that also Islamic philanthropy, which has come really to the fore in terms of the response and which comes with also certain requirements and certain ideas about uh, how the money uh, uh, should be spent. I'm just taking one example, but I'm sure that other uh, organizations benefit from that kind of support. Zakat, which is really uh, the, the religious obligation of uh, uh, every Muslim to dedicate some of, the, of its uh, wealth and income uh, for the poor. The Zakat is a really powerful tool, but it comes also with certain uh, requirements that all the money has to go to uh, the beneficiaries. 100% of the donation of zakat has to end up, if you wish, in the pocket of the um, of the needy, of the most vulnerable. Uh, that that is a challenge in itself because we know that uh, for us to identify the most vulnerable, for us to put in place 
uh, a cash uh, assistance system, we need some extra money for our operational costs. And I'm just flagging uh, uh, this one because I think the big numbers of a big reduction of the um, of the funding towards Yemen may sometimes hide something which is perhaps more worrisome, which is really the fact that uh, a number of donors are ready to um, or are indicating what is the, what is really the the service, the type of intervention, and the type of um, beneficiaries that we, they would like us to, to focus on. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much, John Nicola. And now, why don't I turn to Aiden to see if you have anything to add to, um, to what John Nicola said? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Lisa. And uh, as always, I've kind of very little to add to uh, what Jean uh, has uh, outlined, but I would perhaps stress two points. Uh, one is that I think it's critically important that we uh, not lose sight of the key drivers of the conflict. So uh, while we're uh, working to deal with the symptoms, the consequences, the humanitarian conditions that continue to deteriorate, uh, we cannot lose sight of what the root cause is. The root cause is conflict, the root cause is economic blockade. And I think uh, it's really, really important that uh, there is a continued uh, advocacy engagement through all available channels. Uh, the term that is often used, maximum advocacy, to actually address the root causes of the conflict. So, I mean, talk about solutions. Uh, what humanitarians do are not solutions. We, our work on mitigation, uh, it's usually our short term. Uh, we try and make it as effective as and efficient as we can, but I think it's really, really important that we don't lose sight of that. And I, I can't emphasize the importance of continuing to stress that. You know, we have to kind of continue to push to try and make sure that there is, uh, you know, all efforts to towards ceasefire. There is all efforts towards a lifting of the economic blockade. There is a, an ongoing push. Uh, to try and make sure that there is as uh, what I would call uh, a, a proper process with confidence building measures, whatever it might be. I think the second part is to uh, recognize that uh, whenever we face a situation of overwhelming need and finance or uh, kind of finite financial resourcing, uh, the humanitarian system is forced into a situation uh, which nobody likes, which is prioritization. And uh, the practical dynamics of, uh, you know, choosing, I've used the term carefully, uh, or carefully, choosing between our, a child suffering from cholera, uh, an under five child that is acutely malnourished, uh, should we say someone who has lost their entire uh, livelihoods, uh, their home as a result of displacement, uh, the protection challenges, uh, whether it's sexual violence or otherwise, uh, nobody wants to be in that situation. And I think the, the hard part uh, that we have to recognize is that the more we progress down these lines, uh, the more, shall we say, the humanitarian system uh, will are increasingly focus on those in the acute need and those in the hardest to reach areas. Now, the thing is that uh, by not uh, focusing on the full range of need, what you're opening yourself up to the risk is deterioration over time. So those who, for instance, uh, you know, as you concentrate, on, for instance, C four or five, uh, it means that you may have to do less in phase three, which is what we've seen uh, for much of this uh, year with the reduction of WFP funding. So there is kind of, you know, short term, yes, we can resolve, but medium term, long term, it's going the wrong direction, and I think. Uh, the ask for donors is to try and make sure that, to the maximum extent feasible, uh, we remain as coherent and joined up. And I think the point that Jean Nick was highlighting, that uh, we make sure that you know uh, there is support for the kind of prioritization uh, as kind of presented on the ground, because there's uh, they're not easy choices. Uh, they're extremely difficult choices. Nobody are likes to make it or likes to make these. And then I think the third point that I would highlight again is. The critical importance of ensuring uh, effective and in this particular instance efficient 
So how do we actually make sure that we uh, deliver the maximum amount of aid at the kind of minimum level of cost to the maximum number of people? And that is obviously uh, a conversation that is kind of well underway and will continue to, to take place as we look at what it would call uh, efficiencies to make sure we actually uh, reach the maximum number of people at the kind of our, you know, uh, most uh, sustainable cost, for want of a better word. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. And now I. Eliza. Yes, Borja. Just, yes. just to, 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 to add on the second point of, um, of uh, Aiden, which is extremely important, which yeah. uh, is the task targeting, the fact that we, ha we, we are forced due to the funding limitation to go for the most, most vulnerable. These take us away from the nexus. These take us away from uh, having long-term um, development type of intervention. This takes us away from empowering people uh, to be more self-reliant, uh, to be more, uh, to have more resilience to shock, whether it's the conflict or the flash flooding or or the uh, hunger driven by a, a poor uh, season and so, agricultural season and so on. So I think this is important because here. There's always this tendency of um, the donors, and, and I don't want to put Barjo on, uh, on, the, on the spot, but of, of asking us to go into the exit strategy, moving towards um, uh, avoiding aid dependency and so on. But if we don't have the funding, then we cannot build this self-reliance. We cannot build those mechanisms for the population to, to in, at the end of the day, take care of themselves directly. Thank you. Thank you, jean nicolas Yeah, it, it is a kind of a, a double-edged sword because there's there's pushback from both sides, and and both sides have um, desires and and needs that need to be upheld in order for uh, continued funding and continued access to aid and the ability to continue to function within the country. Um, but it's very difficult to to create a dynamic that works on on both sides. So. Um, Borja, do you have anything to add or or a response to what Jean Nicolas and Aiden have said? Yes, of course. I would like to to take the floor on this one. It's very very relevant for us, um, and it is a, a crucial point. And I think it, taking the elements that uh, were shared already, um, the funding dimension cannot be uh, analyzed in isolation from the drivers and cannot be uh, analyzed in isolation from the working uh, environment, the humanitarian environment uh, in which these funds will be invested. Um, we need to work simultaneously in a, a constructive engagement to improve the environment where we will invest this funding. In the case of ECHO, uh, I have a very comfortable position in this debate because we have the same level of funding today as we had last year. We are not part of those donors that have invested less money in Yemen, but others have, and they may have done it for different reasons and different, uh, different connections with the crisis. But unless we do not improve the working environment of NGOs, it will be very difficult to mobilize all the enormous amounts of funding that are required uh, for Yemen, there is a, a COVID-19 pandemic with huge economic impact. There are other competing priorities and competing crises in the world that are not uh, to be undermined. So there is a constant uh, tension on this. Uh, Yemen last year was relatively well funded compared to other crises, and this year is 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 half of what in proportion what had last year so in in percentage not even in absolute numbers in absolute numbers is even less so um, this is one element um then from eco perspective when it comes more to the how donors um uh, operate uh, about the um uh, pushing for um, self-sustainance uh, uh, beneficiaries, et cetera, and their marking. 
I think we have to be, all of us uh, need to engage in a frank discussion and be very realistic. And of course, we will always, as ECHO, I can speak for ECHO, our, our business model is to be very present in the field. We have a network of experts uh, across the world. Uh, we have been uh, one of the few donors having regular visits to Yemen until just uh, the COVID-19, we were having visits in the north and the south. I was myself in 2018 in, in, in the north of the country. So we and my colleagues have been after that visit in another couple of occasions from HQ, besides the regular visits of the field colleagues. What I'm trying to say is that we, we have um, a willingness to understand the, the dynamics and to play our part together with other actors. It's not a question of us imposing on actors locally to do something impossible. We don't want to do something impossible. We would be crazy to be pushing for something like that. But we have to engage in, in a frank discussion on what we can improve within our limits. And when we are confronted with external pressures, how we can collectively tackle those pressures. And this is exactly what I was trying to say when I was explaining to you the program strategy that we have, trying to prioritize for life-saving uh, activities. We unfortunately cannot invest in all the different needs and all the things that make sense in Yemen, because we have to save as many lives and assist as many people as possible uh, with accountability and uh, in a principled manner. But then uh, we, we, we also engage in the advocacy level uh, with our partners, with all the stakeholders, because we feel that unless we don't tackle these two, it won't work. It won't be sufficient. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, for those remarks, Borja. So um, now we are going to turn to a question from, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, from Mabe in, in the chat. And um, they asked um, a question to Mr. O'Leary. Um, can you give a concrete example, um, hopefully very quickly, about how you um, or OSHA, probably in, in your official capacity, how OSHA uh, works to assist children in the most affected areas in Yemen? So, Aiden, the floor is yours. So many thanks, many thanks, uh, Elise, and many thanks for uh, or the, the the question. I guess the uh, the key our kind of intervention on the OCHA side uh, really is around the uh, humanitarian response planning and the prioritization of interventions uh, in terms of making sure that we have a common situational awareness and also a clear sense of uh, those in acute need uh, and where. And I think. Uh, that part in terms of making sure that all partners, whether it's UN, INGOs, national NGOs, Red Cross uh, donors, we share the same, the same common situational awareness. I think uh, that is probably one key area uh, in terms of where OCHA contributes. The second is in the area of the, uh, the Yemen Humanitarian Fund. And, uh, you know, in Yemen, I think we have something like 10 to 11 UN agencies, 40 to, 5, 40 to 50. Uh, UN, or sorry, INGOs, and our kind of 60 plus, plus national NGO partners. And uh, what we basically seek to do through a range of different allocations is to make sure that uh, resourcing is targeted to where the kind of priorities are kind of uh, most acute at a point in time, or where the gaps are most acute at a particular point in time, taking into account what are the operational delivery rates, and uh, what are the uh, kind of uh, existing levels of funding across uh, individual clusters and partners. Now, when we speak around children, uh, the, our, we're kind of looking at a, a group that kind of spans everything from immunization to malnutrition to IDPs to uh, those are belonging to uh, food insecure families uh, within uh, host communities. So, uh, around uh, the prioritization, uh, what we seek to do is to try and identify where those needs are and then provide what it would call both sex and age disaggregated data to reinforce the targeting to try and make sure that we have the uh, maximum engagement. And if I can give a very clear example, uh, in uh, our kind of our July, August, there was an allocation of more than $35 million uh, 
uh, are from the uh, CERC, which is the HQ level equivalent, uh, which essentially targeted the support of the health system uh, with a particular focus on women and girls. So, uh, you know, should I say, when we looked at the decline in delivery of health services, uh, a number of facilities had closed, certain services had stopped, and essentially what that our allocation was geared towards doing was buttressing the opposite, our, our operation of key health facilities to make sure that there was continued operation to our women and girls, particularly in the area, for instance, of re reproductive health services, because a whole swathe of facilities had been closed in the our six to seven months in the earlier part of the year. Maybe if I stop there, over. Great. Thanks, Aidan. Um, okay, so the next question is for Mona, and I'm also going to give Mona the opportunity to expand on um, what Aidan was saying about women and children, because that is um, definitely one of her areas of expertise. So this question is from Andre Carboni. Um, you mentioned that there is a lack of policy coherence among donors. Um, can you elaborate on this and specifically on how this has affected the humanitarian response? So, Mona, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. It's a good question. And um, I think the, um, we're having this in, on, on multi-layered uh, um, effects um, of this. I think that, um, for instance, the gender marker. We speak about the gender marker in conferences and events, but on the ground, how many of those 60 partners are actually women organizations? Um, and I really want to know more about that because um, what we are hearing from my colleagues and hundreds of women that organizations working in every community, nearly every community in Yemen are not uh, partnering with, uh, with OCHA. So that, that shows that there is uh, here an issue. Um, so I think that's, that, that has really impacted the way uh, we, um, um, beneficiaries are chosen, the, uh, how the aid is uh, delivered to them. For instance, we have many, uh, at many times the cash transfers are um, given or the, even the food aid is given to the male um, um, member of the family. Uh, this is really uh, impacting uh, the, the women and children and impacting their health. Sometimes they sell the, um, the food aid and we have seen a lot of corruption and a lot of um, food aid being diverted. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the main reasons of the, um, the deduction of, uh, of aid, which is, of course, in a way, very justifiable, um, uh, but uh, it's not acceptable in the situation that we are in Yemen, uh, where um, people need the aid. So I just want to say that um, this has really impacted in, um, uh, in, in, in different messages. So it's like conflicting messages. So we, yes, we're going to uh, support, have a gender responsive uh, humanitarian uh, uh, operations on the ground, uh, but uh, in reality, we're seeing uh, a, a, big, uh, a big difference. So I hope that that um, answers part of your question. I also want to speak more about the diversion of aid. Uh, um, this is also one of the uh, main uh, drivers of the, uh, of the famine. Uh, we have been speaking about this for more than six years now because the conflict hasn't been just um, in, in 2015. We had already, I mean, we would be lying if we would say that the conflict only started at that time. We had already had a lot of turmoil and uh, before that. So I think that we also need to address uh, that. I mean, I'll never forget how the, uh, when, we, when we saw the, um, uh, the millions that were um, uh, uh, given to uh, for instance, and it was from uh, food aid, uh, while our children in Yemen are starving. Um, I think that the international community need to really address this and uh, the operations on the ground, specifically the UN agencies, have to really restructure this, prevent this from happening again. Um, we know, we understand the domination of armed groups uh, in the south or in the north, but uh, we also know that um, there are some measures that can Start getting together, making national, but also help preventing this type of uh, um, uh, of corruption, uh, mm -hmm. and also by reducing the costs on the ground of uh, of operations through um, uh, through them. So, um, and and thank you once again. I just want to uh, thank everybody. I also want to say that we are all very grateful for all the work that is being done in Yemen by international organizations. Um, this is um, uh, um, again. Um, a call for humanity 
for all of us to work together and call on the warring parties to go back to the negotiation tables um, and de-escalate and stop this. In 2018, when we um, all worked together to stop the, um, uh, the uh, escalation in Hodeida, the whole world managed to stop uh, the escalation there. Unfortunately, we are not seeing this in Marib, we're not seeing this in Arjo, and this could have catastrophic um, um, uh, impact uh, in the so south or the north. And, it's, uh, um, and thank you so much once again. Wonderful. Thank you, Mona. And um, yes, so thank you to, to your thanks and thank you for being here. Um, I think it's um, important that we just continue to have discussions like this, and that is how hopefully we will um, get these the conflict actors to the negotiating table is just by continuing to to have these difficult conversations and promoting a a discussion between uh, international and local actors, because I do feel that that is um, the most pertinent part of the discussion. So the next question, and hopefully we can wrap up. Quickly, um, we have two more questions um, for Arnod. Part of the subtitle um, was biometric technology. Are there any biometric technology um, technologies or systems used in the humanitarian aid delivery in Yemen? Um, and what do you think of using biometric technologies in humanitarian responses in general? Um, so I'm going to do a shameless plug because we did, like I said at the beginning, um, we did publish a paper at the Brussels International Center on biometric technology in Yemen in uh, August of 2020, so just recently. And it focused on the need to create a more uh, well-rounded and um, civilian prioritized system in Yemen to humanitarian aid. And I think there are, um, I, will, I will speak on my research that I've done, there are biometric technology systems that are um, that exist in the humanitarian aid system in Yemen. Um, but there is a lot of work that I feel needs to be done on, on these systems. So um, let me see. I feel like we can we can combine this a little bit with the last question on the authorities that are responsible for misdistributing um, aid. So what I want to do is ask the, the speakers for their final remarks um, just on the discussion and on these last two um, questions, because I know biometric technology is a very um, specific system within the um, topic of humanitarian aid in Yemen. Um, but then also any responses that you have to, to the discussion in general, your final remarks, um, so that we can wrap up. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and then also discussing the, uh, mistress, the misdistribution of humanitarian aid. Um, Yes, so why don't we start with Jean-Nicolas? Briefly on, on biometrics, oh, of course, it's something that uh, we are all aiming at in terms of uh, oversight and quality control that it allows to ensure that the beneficiaries which have been identified are the one receiving uh, uh, the aid. But it's not a magic bullet. Uh, and it's really often used in relation to cash assistance in particular. Uh, and if we have other means uh, to verify the identity of uh, the people who come, for example, to the bank or, or retrieve uh, uh, money from, from our partners when it's emergency cash in the community centers. So it's, it, it's important to always keep in mind that Yes, this is an aim or this is a goal and something that we will enhance uh, the delivery and the quality of the delivery of uh, assistance. But it's not uh, it's not necessarily just uh, the, the, the magic bullet uh, which will resolve all the issues. Uh, and similarly, I mean, we speak a lot and uh, Aiden was mentioning that probably uh, cash mm -hmm. assistance is between 15 and 25 percent. Cash assistance is also not a magic bullet. It helps a lot uh, to address socioeconomic vulnerabilities, but it has never prevented any civilians from having uh, their house uh, bombed, shelled, or, uh, or for a woman uh, from being uh, raped. Um, and it does not provide, uh, unfortunately, remedial uh, action or remedies, sorry, uh, when violations have occurred because you cannot really necessarily buy uh, 
psychosocial support uh, or specialized medical treatment when you have rape survivors in Yemen because those services are not necessarily um, at, available where, where the, the, the survivor live. Um, in terms of aid diversion, I think this is a, an ongoing discussion. A lot of progress has been done uh, with the support of the donors for us to uh, make it clear again, I come back to the rule of the game. I really think that uh, uh, we are moving into the right direction. There's still uh, progress to be made in terms of um, uh, reducing the, uh, the administrative and logistical hurdles. Um, but but let's be frank as well. There's been, I mean, I've been in this business for 23 years. Uh, it's very rare that uh, the humanitarian partners have uh, a red carpet ahead of them and can do uh, uh, the, the delivery of humanitarian assistance without those hurdles and those obstacles. No, the question is always to know when are we crossing a red line? When uh, saving life at any cost uh, is not anymore acceptable because the at any cost is actually, for example, fueling the conflict. Uh, and I, I, uh, just, just to, to finish on, on, on this point, I think we need to also recognize the specific context of, of Yemen and the specific uh, profile of our uh, counterpart uh, in terms of the authorities. And it is also incumbent on ourselves as on, on the donors to, in a way, I don't like to use the, this word, but to educate our counterpart on what are the rules of the game and why we, are, we want to do certain things a certain way so that we can really work uh, towards a common uh, consensus, which will respect and uphold uh, the basic humanitarian principle. Over. Great. Thank you very much, John Nicola. Um, so why don't I turn to Borhan now to give your uh, final remarks and then um, very, very quickly, very quick final remarks. And then if you have any um, anything to add on um, misdistribution of aid and how how the European Union um, addresses or thinks of that. Thank you, Elisa. Um, yes. As, uh, for me, the uh, one key idea is to uh, remind ourselves that uh, humanitarian aid in Yemen for the last for the last five years has been dragged into a position where it doesn't belong. Uh, with humanitarian aid, we are masking some uh, dynamics, some drivers that are fueling the numbers of need. At the same time, um, we are expected to deliver on a number of issues that go beyond the possibilities and the and the tools that humanitarian aid uh, can offer. So I think it's very important to protect actually the, the, the real space of, of, of humanitarian aid. We are, um, we are actors that should be able to operate independently, neutrally and impartially. And uh, we should not, um, expect that humanitarian aid delivers more than it can. And we as humanitarians, we should uh, try to protect this specific area of work, because if we just go into other ramifications, we will fail. We will, we will not be able to address effectively the problems. And that's why I insist, besides the humanitarian aid and all the efforts to improve its delivery, uh, we need to uh, engage with the parties, as uh, Jean Nicolas said very, very clearly. We must reach out to the different parties and the authorities uh, across the country, and explain uh, what are the minimum conditions for this work to be able to be uh, operated. And uh, at the same time, we need to see as international community, this goes far beyond the humanitarian actors, of course, we need to, to discuss how we can assist in uh, guiding better uh, and more decisive uh, action with drivers of the crisis. A, a large responsibility lays with the parties of the conflict. The international community could help in guiding, in, in giving uh, clear visibility on what needs to be done, predictability in some measures that may avoid uh, 
having a recurrent cliff uh, every few months in Yemen for different reasons that are accumulating and making lives of, of millions very, very difficult. The aid diversion, uh, coming back to your question, Elisa, uh, aid diversion is part precisely of humanitarian space and the principal delivery. And this is very much uh, at the top of our concerns because unless we can, we are ourselves accountable. It's not that we need our partners to be accountable. We are accountable to the European Parliament and the Council on uh, European taxpayers. All this is a chain of accountability and it's a healthy one. It's a healthy one. So uh, it's a healthy one because it keeps us all sharp and focused and efficient and uh, achieving impact. And I think this is, um, this is something that needs to be understood. Unless there is not an improvement in the humanitarian environment in Yemen, it won't be possible, and uh, and we address uh, more effectively some of the drivers. It won't be possible to uh, reach the level of assistance that is needed. I think with this is uh, uh, this summary of, uh, of my main points. Thank you, Lisa. Again, thank you to all and and the other uh, friends in the panel. Great, thank you so much, Borja. And um, Aiden, I will turn to you to give your final remarks and any thoughts that you have on these last couple questions. Uh, many thanks, Elisa. And, and for the time, I'll try and keep it uh, as quick as I can. Um, I think the thing is to be kind of uh, really concrete around what it does it does it mean for effective uh, principled uh, humanitarian delivery, and it means the ability to assess uh, and kind of monitor that those in need actually receive the assistance that they get. And uh, I think it's kind of you know, in very very simple terms, uh, we have to basically do that at scale in Yemen. Uh, fit into this. Uh, you know, when we look at multiple uh, kind of uh, delivery systems, what we have to be clear is that, you know, the assessments, the targeting, uh, the oversight, you know, we need to make sure it's going to those who need it the most. And, uh, you know, when we look at the cash or, uh, arrangements in Yemen, we have everything from the Social Protection Fund, which is basically one and a half million uh, our households uh, per quarter, down to a range of kind of individual UN and uh, or INGO, national NGO interventions. And I think what we really need to be sure is that um, while we want to maximize reach, we have to be really, really conscious that we have to deliver at massive scale. Now, there's a balance and a conversation that needs to take place on that. And the reality is that given the scale, uh, you know, the, what the biometric system tries to do is to take a much more structured and systemic approach to that, uh, which kind of you know, supports in the short term but uh, is also kind of uh, more sustainable in the long term. And I think, you know, uh, getting there is going to be really, really important. I mentioned at the start that, you know, from the, the Brussels SOM meeting in February, uh, you know, we identified, you know, there were seven preconditions and 16 benchmarks for, uh, that were identified to kind of track progress, uh, or particularly racial environment in the North. Uh, the biometric pilot, uh, that, or the biometric program for, uh, our WFP is an essential part of that. There's a very elaborate uh, kind of uh, agreements made, which were concluded uh, in uh, August of last year. Uh, we're now in our October uh, 2020. And unfortunately, the first stage of those benchmarks is the conduct of a pilot in just three districts of Salem. That hasn't happened. The reality is that when we talk about where we want to go, why we want to go, uh, we have to kind of keep remembering that in sometimes as humanitarians, it really is like pushing a boulder up a hill. Pushing, you get absolutely rolled over. And I think what we have to do is that we have to continue to continue uh, or that pressing and that pushing. Uh, and I think the, the benchmarks uh, are all around making sure that, you know, we have this our kind of common conversation to get a better sense of where we on track or not. Sometimes the progress is really impressive. Sometimes it's far less impressive. It's perhaps more impressive on the delivery related uh, benchmarks, 
perhaps uh, not as impressive on the accountability or um, benchmarks. But I, I would like to kind of uh, highlight the point that Jean Nick made. Uh, in all the countries, certainly that I've worked from, uh, you know, our, uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, or Gaza, uh, it's not easy. Solutions, there's no magic wands. Uh, the only way to do it is to be very clear about your direction of travel and keep pushing. And pushing because we think it's a nice idea. We're pushing because as humanitarians, ensure that those in acute need need or get every piece of assistance that they actually require. Okay. By doing that, what it helps us to do is that it helps to assure uh, or ultimately the donors who also have to account to their taxpayers that you know, the complicated is or not straightforward, but we continue to push in a very particular way to make sure that we have the very best outcomes for people in need. And I think uh, we need to make sure that uh, when we look at principled approaches, it's not one over the other, it's indivisible. And we need to make sure that that kind of pressure and squeeze doesn't go away. And it's a common fight. It's a and as I say, ultimately, uh, as humanitarians, we are accountable to those that we serve. And that's a, a, uh, something that we're going to have to maintain the pressure on. No matter how bad it gets, we need to keep pushing. So maybe just to uh, our kind of friend like that. And a diversion, uh, you know, the kind of dynamics around, you know, effective targeting of populations, uh, which is the, you know, ultimately where uh, our biometrics fits in. That's where we want to go, because we know that when it's done properly, what it does make is much more effective and efficient and principled approaches going forward. So we are going to continue to pull. All right. Uh, thank you, Aidan. And I mean, this discussion could go on for for hours and hours. Biometrics is just a very small part of um, how to create an effective humanitarian aid system. And clearly, there are many faults within this biometric technology um, and obstacles that are in place um, or that exist um, that prevent biometrics from being being um, a better system in Yemen. Um, I very quickly want to give Mona. 30 seconds, just super, super quickly. Um, and then, um, yes, so again, thank you all for sticking around. I know we've gone past time and thank you to the speakers who have um, created a really wonderful discussion today. Um, so Mona, 30 seconds, and then we will we'll wrap up for the, for the final remarks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Lisa. I just wanted to, um, uh, to point on uh, the last point here uh, that we really need to work together uh, to release the salaries of the Yemeni uh, uh, civil servants. This is really um, um, impacting uh, the people. And um, I, I really want to um, emphasis on, uh, emphasize on this to exert pressure on the internationally recognized government and international dollar donors to uh, really take steps to address the economic collapse and uh, support the uh, the, uh, the Yemen uh, economy uh, recovery and um, and support the release of the uh, salaries. Thank you so much to everybody and uh, much appreciation to all the heroes in the front lines from the international community, from the local community who are risking their own lives to save the lives of others. And thank you so much for you all. Thank you so much, Mona. And um, again, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone today, especially the speakers for um, your valued expertise and information that you shared with us today. Um, and I hope that we can continue to have these discussions um, and hopefully see you all at more events in the future. Um, so from the Brussels International Center, please um, keep up with us on Twitter and Facebook and follow our website where we release all of our publications. And um, Jean-Nicolas, Borja, Aiden, Mona, I just wanted to take one more opportunity to thank you. And um, with that, we will conclude today's webinar. And thank you all so much for joining. Have a great day. Thank you to our great moderator, Elisa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you, Mona, very soon. Yes, you too. Yeah, I hope so too. And uh, let's keep in touch. Yeah, it's all my dear. Absolutely. Take care. Ciao, ciao. Thanks thank for everything. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.